to try to finish up chapter 18. So the next framing question that we need to deal with is this, what are some evidences of evolution? And so chapter 19 talked about the mechanisms of evolution. Chapter 20 put it to if, 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 if evolution is the explanation for how you get all of the diversity of life, what would that look like? And then 18 really talks about, you know, are, is there a reason to suppose that universal common descent is true? So to answer this question, you really have to define what you mean uh, by evolution. And so we've got uh, macroevolution, which is entirely what chapter 19 is all about. All of your five mechanisms of evolution, natural selection, sexual selection, mutations, gene flow, genetic drift, those are all mechanisms of microevolution, changing allele frequencies. And then you have macroevolution, also known as universal common descent or descent with modification. And this is saying if you extrapolate that out far enough, then you could explain all of the diversity of life through those five mechanisms. Now, we see microevolution happen nearly every single day. You can, you can watch it. Now, it's really from generation to generation, uh, but there's overwhelming evidences for microevolution, for changing allele frequencies, right? We, we talked about natural selection. What three types of natural selection are there? There's one in which the average condition is maintained, but more individuals have that average condition. What do we call that? Stabilizing selection. You have where individuals with the average condition are selected against. What is that? Disruptive selection. And then you have where one of the extremes are favored. Directional selection. You got to work these out. I know you, had, you don't have your study guide yet for exam four. And, and, and we talked about this, I think, on Monday, that knowledge has a half-life. And when you don't feed it over a week of Thanksgiving break while you're busy feeding something else, right, some of it just disappears. I understand that, but you, you, you got to bring some of that back. Now, there are also many evidences for universal common descent. Um, some of these similar developmental processes. We've already talked about this for chordates and what other phylum? Echinoderms or echinodermata, similar developmental pathways, uh, vestigial structures where you have something that no longer functions uh, the way it did in the past, uh, more advanced forms showing up later in the fossil record, transitional series in the fossil record. Now we talked many times that there are not a, there are not very many good examples of transitional series. And, and previously we used that as an example against universal common descent. There are some that actually present some, what look to be uh, good transitional series. The horse series is a good example of this. Um, if you wanna look, look through that. Uh, the jaw to the middle ear transition in cynodonts. We talked through that as well. Another evidence for universal common descent, uh, shared structural, behavioral, or functional features. Okay, another way of saying this is homologous features. Homologous features. Uh, evidence of bad design. At the very end of chapter 19, we had a, a, a question, a framing question, that basically said, why aren't populations perfect? Right? Do you remember that question? Do you remember how we answered that question? Why aren't populations perfect? There's only one mechanism of evolution that is adaptive. Tara. Oh, yeah, so sometimes a bad allele piggybacks on a good allele for a different gene, right? Because the genes are so close together on the chromosome that those two genes get inherited as a unit, okay? Yeah, so that's one of the issues. There's only one mechanism that is adaptive, and what is that? Well, it's because, save that. that, that's the answer to the bigger question. But what, 
What is the only adaptive mechanism of evolution, of microevolution? Natural selection. So because there are other mechanisms such as, Chris? Uh, bottleneck. bottleneck events, which is one of our examples of genetic drift, that because there are other mechanisms of evolution and sometimes those mechanisms or those forces are stronger than natural selection, another reason why some populations or most populations are not perfectly adapted. These are used uh, as evidences of, of basically to try to explain this is, this is bad design. And so what I want you to do, we're going to take a lecture break uh, real quick. Uh, we're not going to talk about this among ourselves. I just want you to think about it for a little bit. I want you to think where, where should we expect to see more evidence against universal common descent than for it? Okay? Because what scripture teaches, in, 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 if Genesis 1 and 11 are history, are history, historical facts, which the Bible seems to indicate that they are, okay, then universal common descent cannot be true. Right? Because God created different kinds and basically all at the same time. All right? And I said basically all at the same time because it's days five and six and actually day three for the plant kinds. Anyways, and so basically all at the same time. And so then there should be, we should expect to find then more evidence against universal common descent than we have for it. But there are evidences for universal common descent where should we expect to find evidences against it? Take about a minute, just think about this, maybe jot some ideas down, and then we'll talk about it collectively, okay? You don't need to talk about it with those around you. Just think about it, maybe jot some ideas down. Take a minute, starting now. Anyone have some ideas of where we should expect to find more evidence against universal common descent than for it? Chris? Could, like, looking at the genome, like okay. comparing and realizing that maybe morphologically animals look similar or something like that, and then we actually look at their genome and we realize, like, oh, man. It's interesting to mention the genome, and, and we haven't talked very much about genetic programming in this class because this is it's not a cell biology class and it's certainly not a genetics class um, but when you when you look at the amount when you look just at genes so the portions of the genome that produce proteins there's an enormous amount of similarity among living forms okay when you look at the rest of the genome the parts that don't directly produce proteins but instead regulate the production of other portions of the genome, the parts that become protein, enormous differences, enormous differences. So if all you look at are the protein coding portions of our genome and compare it with the chimpanzee genome, that's where you get numbers of like 98% sequence homology. When you look over the entire genome, it's not anywhere close to that. Okay, it's more like 75%. Okay, and it's once you get outside of those protein coding regions, you get some very interesting differences that all need to be accounted for. And so absolutely, I think that's, that's definitely a place where, where we should expect to find more evidence against universal common descent than for it. Any other ideas? Yeah, Allison. I was thinking when you try to compare uh, the taxa higher up, so like within a lower taxa, you have the picture of the, the birds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great example of natural selection, by the way, the work done with the Galapagos finches. It's the, easy to see the relationships mm -hmm. by, by trying to find Right. So when you when when your phylogeny 
steps back and starts to include very inclusive groups, that's where we should start to expect to find more evidence against universal common descent than for it, right? Is that what you're saying? So when we get into groups that are like at high taxonomic ranks, like we're trying to connect all of the phyla of animals, okay? You should start to expect to find more evidence against universal common descent than for it, right? But if you're just doing a phylogeny of a single family of mammals, now you might expect to find more evidence for it than against it. Good, I like it. Any other ideas? Yeah, David. For that previous statement, is that the one where you're trying to force groups? Oh, sure, trying to force groups into a phylogeny that aren't related ancestrally, right? So, like, if you're trying to create a phylogeny, assuming that all of your groups in your phylogeny share ancestry, which is what I, I think I looked at every group's phylogeny, and every group's phylogeny included forms that probably do not belong together. And so, y y y you ex which is okay. I didn't tell you that your phylogeny couldn't include taxa that, that don't actually share ancestry. But what you'd expect to find in those situations is, yeah, I mean, they, they should be a little messy, right? Your, your phylogeny, you should be able to produce several different phylogenies that tell a completely different story. Like I saw some of you that use different groups of vertebrates but told a different story than what the textbook does, but it's because of the synapomorphies you chose. But your story's completely supported by the synapomorphies you chose, and, and it just tells a completely different story. And it shows you the bias towards what features do you think are most important, right? Any other ideas of where we should expect to find more? Cameron. Yeah, so wherever you'd expect to find evidence of really sophisticated design, right? So when you get to like an entire population, you, you're like, it, I mean, it, there, it's a little bit chaotic, right? It's a little bit chaotic at the population level because you see like more individuals are born than can possibly survive. You see some forms are just not successful. They can't secure mates or they don't live very long. You see this, this chaos, right? And it helps you to kind of accept the idea that, that organisms are not really well designed if you're focusing only at the population level because you see, you see a lot of death, you see a lot of chaos, you see a lot of destruction. But when you focus at the smallest levels of organization and you look like you said at the cellular level or even at the molecular level within the cell and how sophisticated it is for the cell that function you, 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 yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at life at that level, it's incredibly difficult to see more evidences for universal common descent than against it. Except, you know, that a lot of those mechanisms are present in all living forms, which means that all of those mechanisms would have needed to develop basically at the same time life is starting, because those are required for life. It's, it's challenging. So another one, and nobody said this, is a fossil record, right? We've mentioned many, many times in this class when the fossil record does not support universal common descent. Lack of transitional series, right? When you just have a whole bunch of diversity show up at the same time, like in the Cambrian explosion, all right? So here's a, uh, a representation of the horse series uh, out, of, out of the text uh, on the right, showing you the different varieties of living and extinct members of the horse family. By the way, the entire horse family consists of one living genus, and it seems that all of them are capable of hybridizing, all of the members of that genus. Now, most of the time, the offspring are sterile, but they're capable of hybridizing. You can get a Zorse and a Hebron and a Zonkey, right, that you can form these, these hybrid animals. And then we've talked about hominids uh, before, where we actually have hybrids. So here is this idea of shared structural features, similar bones uh, found in the different groups of vertebrates. And so, again, a lot of this is used uh, as evidence for universal common descent, which is certainly one way to interpret this. The other way to an interpret a homology, and we've talked about this, one way to interpret a homology is shared feature because of shared ancestry. What's an alternative way to interpret homology? What about shared? Yeah, go ahead, Allison. Uh, shared features because of, I don't know, what 
shared features because of a common design, right? That there are just certain designs that work well, right? And so even though you have groups that according to Genesis 1 are separate groups of creation, I don't think there's any reason why we should doubt that they are separate groups of creation, and yet they share some developmental similarities and some anatomical similarities. And so, again, that homology could be because of shared ancestry, but it could just as very well be because of a shared design, that there's a certain design that works and is very flexible. So you see it in different forms in the different groups. All right. So the next question we're going to deal with is, uh, how does the theory of evolution explain the diversity of life? So how does the, ter the, the theory of evolution explain the diversity of life? And so we've done this a little bit in chapter 20 when we, when, and, and in various chapters through our semester so far where we've looked at phylogenies, right, which are a, a picture of the evolutionary history of, of particular groups. But I want to point out, um, I want to point out something. Um, there's, there's a question that you have to ask to answer this question, and it's, and it's what do we mean by the term theory? So the common use of this term indicates this kind of idea of a, of a best guess, right? Like I have a theory as to what happened, right? Any of you share a bedroom with a sibling growing up or still? And, and you come into your bedroom and your stuff is askew and you didn't leave it askew, right? You, you theorize that your sibling got into your stuff, right? Which only happens once if they're the younger <laughs> sibling, right? Never happens never happens again. Just kidding. It happened all the time. Which, Anyways, my brother, we're, we're, we're good now, in case you're worried. Um, but this isn't the way we use it in science. It's not, it's not a best guess as to what happened. The, the meaning of theory in science uh, is, is, a, is, a, it is an incredibly well-supported illustration of why something happens. Okay? And so it, the, the, the theory of evolution, it, it's, not, it's not this idea of this is our best guess as to what, you know, what explains the diversity of life. That's, that's not the way you should think of the theory of evolution. That's not the best guess because it's not the best guess. Okay, what the theory of evolution is, is it's a, it's a well-supported illustration of why something exists, of why there's this diversity, of why these organisms are structured this way. Okay? Okay. Yeah. All right. This is something we've mentioned many times in this semester, and it, it, it sums up this idea. So universal common descent or macroevolution or descent with modification, whatever you want to call it, uh, basically explains that all living organisms uh, descend from a single survival machine, from a single living organism. And then over time, mutations and some other mechanisms developed additional variation and then primarily natural selection but also our other forces of evolution um, basically make some alleles more common than other alleles and you get some variation among forms and so the idea here is this has generated all of the diversity of life you can't make statements that any form is more or less evolved than any other, okay? According to universal common descent, humans would be just as evolved from the original survival machine as ants would be, okay? It's just different trajectories. Because each species is adapted, although not perfectly, for its specific niche. So the reason why we are different than an ant is not because we are any more evolved than an ant is, but it's because we are adapted for a different niche than ants are. So remember, natural selection is the only adaptive mechanism of evolution, and all of the other forms tend to be maladaptive. So somebody give me an example of how genetic drift can be maladaptive. Remember, genetic drift, these are random changes in allele frequencies. Yeah, Micah. So isn't one of them the bottleneck effect? Yeah, it doesn't always have to be, right? Because your bottleneck could, could eliminate all of the bad forms of a particular gene, right? But, but 
but so. but certainly so. So a bottleneck event is when your population shrinks uh, to a, to very few individuals. And that would Yes, it, it, it's going to eliminate some alleles altogether, and then it's going to make, oftentimes it's going to make alleles that were rare more common. Okay, if it didn't eliminate them altogether and they were rare, now they're going to be more common because there are fewer individuals. Yeah, Hayden. Would allopatric speciation be So you're talking about like the geographic isolation yeah. that happens first? Yeah. Um, it, it, it depends on what the mechanism is for that geographic isolation. Um, so you have, I don't think we talked about this and I don't think we will. We used to do a chapter on biogeography in organismic, but it was too, it was too heavy. It was just, it was too heavy. You're like, Dr. Ringel, a lot of what we talk about is, is pretty heavy. Yeah, but this one was too heavy. Um, but you have basically two different um, mechanisms for geographic isolation. One is called vicariance where some geographic feature just appears, right? You've got like some kind of uh, maybe an earthquake or a tsunami, and it just completely changes the geography of an area, right? So that's, that's called a vicariance event. Um, and then the other one is called dispersal, where you just have a group that goes and leaves somewhere. That's far more common, right? And so we see that with like the founder effect, where some portion of the mainland population goes and founds a new population, oftentimes on an island, okay? All right, any other explanations for how drift, genetic drift, these random mutations are maladaptive? No, they're not random mutations, sorry. Random changes in allele frequency are maladaptive. Have these ever been uh, messed up by like natural disasters? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Natural, natural disasters are a great mechanism for bottleneck effects. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in populations that aren't, don't have a wide geographic distribution. Allison and Levi, did you have your hand up? Yeah. So we'll go Allison and then Levi. So with inbreeding, I'm thinking of like European Okay. And how they all felt the same blood disorder. Yeah, and, and so you, I, I'm, I have a difficult time calling that rant, like genetic drift. Uh, you'd probably put that under the category of sexual selection, right? Where some individuals uh, had had better access to mates, not because of them being particularly better adapted for their environment, but because of something the mate chose in them. In this case, it was being from the same bloodline. Yeah. Levi. Um, yeah, no, I was just gonna say that it just sort of makes sense that if you have alleles or Phenotypes kind of appearing, disappearing in different uh, at different rates, kind of at random. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, genetic drift is yeah. yeah I mean, it, it's it doesn't always have to be maladaptive, right? Genetic drift could could help you out. It could eliminate something that natural selection is eliminating really, really slowly. Uh, but oftentimes, what genetic drift is going to do is make rare genetic abnormalities more common. Yeah. All right, so here are some examples of um, something that is preserved uh, by natural selection, but this is also a, a convergent feature. This is analogous of having white uh, plumage in the winter and the darker plumage in the rest of the year. So over here we have a ptarmigan and it loses the white plumage when winter ends and takes on more of like a, a brown plumage. And then here's an Arctic fox, which does the same, and then Arctic hares uh, do the same. And so you, you have this, your, your plumage at any particular time of the year is dependent upon environmental characteristics. Plumage, yeah, it's a great word. It's a great word. All right, and so this is an example of convergence in which it, it happened in two different groups, uh, but it is certainly maintained by natural selection. Now, it can't be generated by natural selection it has to be generated by having the genetic capability to do this and then um, maintained by natural selection here's some uh, examples of the variation within a single uh, it's really just a single subspecies uh, of dog oh here are two different breeds and then 
they the product of the two, the cockapoo. Okay. And then here, again, and another example of convergence, two different uh, birds of prey, two different raptors having very, very similar uh, structures. Oh, my goodness. And then here's kind of the, the tree of life applied for uh, an elephant. And then this is just kind of this idea of this is, this is essentially how you generate the variation, right? You start with a single form, and then through speciation events, you generate uh, the, different, um, the different species or different taxa uh, inside of your phylogeny. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a lecture break now, and I know we're getting towards the end of class, but we're gonna we're gonna we're we're really gonna commit ourselves to this lecture break because we don't have many left, and you know that these lecture breaks appear on exams, and we don't have many of those left. So you're gonna dedicate <laughs> yourself uh, to this lecture break. And so what I want you to do is this: I want you to take a phylogeny. If you want to take the one you use for your quiz, that's fine. I, I want you to take a phylogeny. You can draw a new one or you can take the one you did for the quiz. And I want you to point out evidences against the taxa in these phylogenies sharing a single ancestor. Okay? So your quiz, you went through and you built a phylogeny and then explained all of your branching events with particular synapomorphies, right? What you were doing, I don't know if you knew this is what you were doing, but you were demonstrating how the evolutionary history of this group could produce those different forms. Now I want you to go in and on that phylogeny or another one, I want you to go in and, and demonstrate evidences against all of those forms sharing a single ancestor, okay? Take two minutes. You can work with others on this if you'd like, uh, starting now. 26, 27. Um, so the all of these are like reporting If I were you, this is how I might approach something like this. Now, I don't, I don't want to make any groups feel as though your phylogeny were not as good as this one, but this is one of the phylogenies from one of the groups, and I just, I, I happen to find it simple to display it on the board. That's why I chose it. Okay, I don't think it's better than your phylogeny necessarily, 
It may be, but it's, I mean, there, let's just put it this way. I didn't put this one on the board because I felt like it was better. I'm not going to say whether or not I do feel, anyway, sorry. Okay, and so here are the synapomorphies, right? So this synapomorphy would unite all of these groups and would separate them from any other eukaryotic group. Okay, the presence of chlorophyll, and I don't think this is spelled right, but anyways. Uh, alternation of generations, not present in green algae, definitely present in all of our plants, right? Now it's different in our bryophytes, what's the dominant stage? This is exam two, I think. This may be exam one. No, this, this might be. I think it's two. What's the dominant stage? Don't say sporophyte. Gametophyte. And then all of these three, this sporophyte is the dominant stage. So you could use that as your synapomorphy anyways. Uh, and then seeds, these are seed plants, coated seeds. Uh, gymnosperms don't have coated seeds. Okay, and so we have synapomorphies to connect all of these. But that's not what I asked you to do, right? This is what I asked you to do for your quiz. What I asked you to do in this lecture break and what you need to be prepared to do in a week and then again five days later when we take our final exam is I need you to be prepared to take a phylogeny like this and to point out issues that might complicate this a little bit more. Now for plants, I'm just going to say this, and I know we've talked about this now maybe five times, that knowledge has a half-life, but you should have no problem pointing out issues with all of these sharing a single ancestor. What are some of the issues? Uh, Tara? Just in general, the splitting, like, at archaeoplasty, isn't it just really easy to try and fit all of the different um, organisms, just green algae versus red algae versus yeah, absolutely. So what, what this contains is, is a very, very interesting convergent feature, right? Because what this does is it forces you to pull green algae, algae or green algae and separate them apart from the brown, the red, and the golden algae, right? That's sad. But the main evidence that I would use against this comes from the fossil record. Not in the order, because these show up in this order. Well, actually, that's not true. Green algae don't show up until later. But the plants show up in this order. First plant to show up in the fossil record, which by this phylogeny, the most primitive plant group is what? According to this phylogeny? It's the bryophytes. Okay? Because, remember, it has the fewest number of branching events to get to that modern taxon. Okay? And so this one, it's basically just a single branch. If all we're doing is restricting it to plants, it's a single branch, right, to get to our bryophytes. Okay, so this is our most primitive group. It shows up first in the fossil record. This is our next most primitive group, and it shows up next in the fossil record. And this is our next most primitive group, and it shows up next in the fossil record. And finally, this is our most derived group, or our least primitive, and it shows up last way, way, way late. I mean, it, it should show up way earlier than it does, but it doesn't. But that's another story for another time. We've, we've somewhat had that story told already. All right? So it's not, it's not the order that's the issue. What's the issue with the fossil record of these plants? There are no transitional forms to connect the various groups. And whenever a new group shows up, it shows up with an enormous amount of diversity. Okay, when it shows up, it shows up with an enormous amount of diversity and no transition from an older form. So like gymnosperms show up, gymnosperms exist for a while, then angiosperms show up in a whole bunch of different varieties with no real connection with gymnosperms. Now, we could tell a story of, of how angiosperms could have come from gymnosperms, and I think you, you did that on exam three. Okay, but... But again, it's, it's not supported by the fossil record. All right, here's our last question that we'll deal with today, and therefore this week. You know, after this, we only have two more classes together, because I will not proctor exam four. <laughs> I will proctor your final, maybe. Um, 
Actually, I probably will proctor exam for it because I have a faculty meeting afterwards anyways. Like, I can't go anywhere. I'd just be sitting in my office. Yeah, David. Uh, question on the Oh, yeah. Thing. Um, I mean, but, I was done. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, can someone argue that, oh, it, but it's increasing in complexity? Oh, absolutely. And, there, and, and that's, that's something you could argue about the entire fossil record, is that as you move to more recent deposits, you increase in complexity. And that's, that's, that's absolutely a feature of most of the fossil record. So then what would be the argument against that one? Well, the, it, so you're, you're not going to, you would say yes, that, that's oh. evidence of the, of, from the fossil record that supports this. But other evidences or lack thereof in the fossil record point against this being the story. And that's the lack of transitional forms and the appearance of an enormous amount of diversity. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you can't get away from the fact that, that these, these forms show up in the right order in the fossil record. You can also point out that angiosperms show up so late in the fossil record when they, when they would have had to have been around at the beginning of the Mesozoic in the Triassic, but then you don't actually start finding angiosperm pollen until the Cretaceous. And the, you, I mean, you, you have an issue regardless of your view of origins with angiosperms. They just, they show up way too late in the fossil record. Okay. Because if you take any deposit from the Cenozoic, any Cenozoic rock, you're going to find an enormous amount of angiosperm pollen. doesn't matter where you take it from. You find Cenozoic rock in Antarctica, and you're going to find angiosperm pollen. And there, I don't know if you know this or not, but there aren't a lot of fruiting plants in Antarctica. <laughs> There aren't a lot of people in Antarctica either. Levi and then Allison. I had a, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One question is how, if you had any thoughts of how that could have happened in a global Oh, of why angiosperms show up so late if they were already there? Yeah, the order of complexity thing. Oh, sure, um, sure. And then also, uh, is the fossil record an adequate answer for this kind of question on most of any plant phylogeny? Most of your phylogenies, you, you, you can use the fossil record as evidence against uh, shared ancestry due to lack of transitional forms. I mean, that's an issue in the fossil record period. That, that's what led uh, many evolutionary biologists to completely abandon Darwinian thinking and to pr propose alternative mechanisms. Because it's just, what, what, you, what you see in the fossil record is not slow transition from simple to complex. What you see in the fossil record is, you see that simple to complex, but, but it's not slow. It's like simple for a long time and then boom, more complex forms, they persist for a while and then boom, more complex forms. It's not this slow transition. Mm -hmm. Allison. So if the story goes from simple to complex, why do evolutionists not say that things are more evolved than others? Um, living forms. So, I mean, you would definitely go and, and, and look at some of the fossil forms and to say this was less evolved, right? This is more primitive. But as far as modern forms, you can't, you can't really make that argument. If they're modern forms, uh, they're, they're, all, they're all equally evolved. They've all spent a, an equal amount of time from that common ancestor, right? If the, if the, common, uh, the proposal is that the common ancestor for all living forms existed somewhere around 3 billion years ago. So the amount of time passed from ants to that ancestor is three billion years. The amount of time passed from humans to that ancestor is three billion years. So both ants and humans have three billion years worth of evolution separating them from that universal common ancestor, right? Mm -hmm. But now forms that are pre-Cambrian and don't exist any, anywhere past that, now they may only be separated by two and a half billion years. And so they would be less evolved, so to speak, than others. Man, you all did that on purpose, didn't you? I wanted to go to the next question, and then you are like, hey, David, <laughs> when Dr. Engel tries to go to the next question, why don't you ask him to go back to this? But I don't know what purpose that would serve for you, because we still met for just as long as we would have if we would have gone over another question. All right, have a wonderful weekend. Be safe. Make good decisions. Study, study. You did drop that study guide? I am going to.